Yep. Great. Well, welcome. We are so glad you're here today. Welcome to our lunch series presentation on golden cheeked warblers with Chris Murray. I'm Judith Allen, the operations coordinator of Travis Audubon. If you're already a member, we thank you so much for your support of our mission to, con to inspire conservation through birding. If you're not yet a member, we welcome you in and encourage you to become one. We are so grateful for those of you who have chosen to make a donation today. That's one of the many ways that you can support us right now, and we thank you very much. We are still encouraging gifts through our Resilience Fund, which is helping us keep afloat over the next several months. And we are also selling a fabulous limited edition Travis Audubon bandana for the next several weeks. You can find more information on both of those on our website. Now, I'd like to make a few housekeeping requests. If you could please mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the presentation, that will help us to minimize distractions. If you have a question, Chris will be able to answer them at the very end of the presentation. The easiest way to do this is to enter them in the chat box as you think of them and we'll return to them as time permits. Okay, so let's get started. I would like to introduce Chris Murray, who is currently the land manager and educator at Baker Sanctuary. Chris has been birding since 1998 and has been working at Travis Audubon since 2010. Chris, whenever you are ready, we're very excited to hear from you today. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, let me get my sh screen shared here and make sure that gets going. All right, so today we're going to talk a lot about golden cheek warblers. Um, I've given this presentation in the past and um, to a live audience, this is going to be a little bit weird for me because usually I have a lot of participation when I do this, but I think with this format, like uh, Judith mentioned, everybody's going to save their questions for the end. So, so I'll just kind of barrel through it, um, try not to be too boring. I think when I talk at computer screens, I tend to adopt this monotone. So hopefully I don't put anybody to sleep uh, during their lunch hour. So. Um, Anyway, with further ado, here we go. So, <clears throat> now we'll be talking about the um, golden cheek warbler in general, uh, natural history and things like that. And where I can, I will throw in some information about Baker and how that relates to golden cheek warblers as well. Um, I certainly won't cover it all. This is more designed as a, oops, sorry, I gotta stop messing with the screen video always looks weird. This is more designed as a um, like an introduction to golden cheek warblers. So if you don't know much about them, you should learn a lot. If you know a lot about golden cheek warblers, um, you'll probably learn less from this presentation, but there may be a few things in there that you didn't know. So anyhow, we'll go from there. So let's see if this works. So far it's not. Um, let's try this button. I'm going to stop the share and start it again and see if it right now it's like it's frozen. So let me, uh, let me stop the share for a second. Let's do it this way. And Slide. All right, there we go. Seems to be working. So, first slide, what you're looking at is just um, where Baker is located geographically. So, right here is Baker. It's about 714 acres. And some landmarks are 183 is over here. Lime Creek Road kind of splits the sanctuary in half almost right through the middle. They've got Anderson Mill Road and 
that sort of thing. But a lot of the land to the west and to the south is Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve Land, and to the um, to the east here is, as you can see, a lot of neighborhood. So the whole southeast border, there's you know, a ton of uh, kind of low density housing, and then to the south and to the west, we have uh, Travis County owns most of that land. Anyway, so Golden Cheek Warbler, here it is, the mighty Golden Cheek Warbler. Um, one of the questions that I usually ask people is, you know, who's seen one? And typically, depending on the audience, I'll get most every hand come up. And then I show them this picture. This is the lesser goldfinch. And I'm like, is this the bird you saw? And usually about half the hands will go down. So, I mean, there are some similarities between these two. They, Lesser goldfinch has a lot of yellow on it. It's a pretty common bird. You know, if you've got a uh, bird feeder or something like that at home, you're, you're definitely going to see this bird, probably got your bird feeder. But this is not a golden cheek, you can tell from you know, looking at the bill, looking at the coloration of the bird. Another bird that people get confused with is a black throated green. And this one's a little trickier because uh, black throated greens, they're not as common as lesser goldfinch here. They just kind of pass through as they head north to the breeding grounds. But um, if you look at it, it looks kind of like a female um, golden cheek warbler. The difference is if you look, there's like this little kind of a patch on its cheek there where you have this little um, semicircle sort of area beneath the eye, whereas the golden cheek is usually just that eye stripe that goes straight through the eye. And also, if you see a bird like this, black throated green and it's singing, that's usually a good indication that it's not a golden cheek warbler because only the males will be singing. This is uh, probably a male a black throated green. So, you know, there are a couple of birds you can get it confused with uh, here, but if you look for, you know, the golden cheek, that eye stripe through the eye, the black cap and the, the black throat, that should be good enough to um, let you identify it pretty easily. Okay, a little bit of history about the golden cheek wobbler. Strangely enough, it was uh, first collected in Guatemala by a British naturalist. Um, he's British, so I'm gonna call him Osbert, but if he was French, I'd call him Osbert um, Selvin in 1859. Back then they collected things by paying a local to go shoot them with a shotgun. So um, I imagine he, he was just down there and he paid somebody to shoot a bunch of birds. And one of them happened to be a golden cheek warbler because if you, we'll talk more about this later, but if you go down to their wintering grounds, um, they are actually kind of hard to find. So, so to me, it's kind of interesting that you know, the first known uh, observation of this bird was from uh, Guatemala, 1859. So there's Oz Bear his older years. He was a famous ornithologist in Britain and herpetologist as well. If you get famous enough as a scientist, they will probably name something after you. So this is a type of uh, spiny lizard where the, um, I think it's the species name, it's named Salvini, but this is related to the spiny lizards that we have in Texas. But this one I think is only found uh, down in Central America. So after that, it wasn't until 1864 that the first uh, golden cheek was collected in Texas, and that was in south of San Antonio by a 17 year old, uh, Duncan Ogden Jr. And I think once again, you know, the birds were shot and uh, uh, they had a golden cheek warbler as one of their specimens. All right, so anyway, fast forward to now. Um, the golden cheek was listed as endangered in 1990 by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And once that happened, uh, you know, I got a lot of attention locally. Um, here in Travis County, um, the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve was made. And that's something that uh, Baker Sanctuary is a part of now, but it protects about 31,000 acres for the Golden Sheep Warbler, uh, Black Cap Vireo, and some Carson vertebrates that are also listed on that permit. But as you can tell by this map, Baker is right here, it's the one in yellow. And then the green stuff is owned by the city of Austin, which is one of the permit holders with Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the purple polygons are Travis County, and there's a few other people like LCRA and 
Um, TNC has some land as well. There's also some private landowners that actually have some land in the PCP. But in total, it's a kind of a more continuous uh, preserve system than what we could have preserved if this uh, preserve wasn't uh, made. But that's a whole other story. That's like a whole different presentation. So I'm not gonna go too far into that. If you have questions about the DCP, you know, it's just put them in the chat box and we can talk about it later. But it's a pretty uh, fascinating subject, one which Valerie Bristow, who former Travis Audubon president was definitely a part of uh, getting this off the ground. All right, so let's look at a little natural history of the Golden Cheek Warbler. Um, basic stuff, it's a neotropical migrant, so it's not here year round. It does breed here, but then it goes down south in the winter. So when they're in Texas, they're only here from, we say March to July, but I've seen them here in August. By August, they're definitely disappearing. And usually by mid-August, uh, they're pretty much all gone. It's a safe bet. Um, if you look at this map here, you'll see that they only nest in Texas. I got to move this over a little bit. My cursor. Anyway, so they, they nest up in Texas and then they'll fly. They don't go over the Gulf like some neotropical migrants do. Instead, they fly down through Mexico mountains. They go down to Central America. So that's roughly, you know, depending on where they start and where they end, you know, 1,500 miles one way. So every year when they go down south for the winter and they come back up here for the spring, that's roughly 3,000 miles that they're flying this you know, tiny little. Uh, Neotropical uh, migrant. So they got quite the journey. A lot of them don't make it, a lot of them do. And they breed exclusively in Texas, like I mentioned before. So it's the only endemic nesting bird for the state. And the number of counties that they're found in always seems to vary. I don't, I haven't really gotten a firm number on this is the official number of counties. This one says 38. I've heard less than that. 33, 34, but you know, essentially this is the gist of it. You know, they're in central Texas, a little bit south, um, but only in Texas. They don't breed in Oklahoma or anywhere else or Mexico. Must in Travis County, in my opinion, there's probably some folks that would argue with me about this, has the highest, um, highest quality breeding habitat for this bird. And the uh, habitat is the least fragmented. Some of these places, especially if you go down south, um, I mean, there are birds there, but they're definitely not as thick as they are up here in uh, Western Travis County. So it's good that we have the PCP. Typically, they arrive around March 11th. Um, the males usually come first, and then the female, females will come a little bit later. If you want to see a golden cheek warbler and you haven't seen one yet, um, they vocalize most in mid-April, usually the best time to go looking for them because they're singing a lot. They're still um, very vocal. This time of year, I mean, the birds are still here, but you can go out into the forest and you'd be lucky to hear one. But in April, there's a lot of songs going on, a lot of activity. Um, so if you haven't seen one and you do want to see one, I would definitely recommend trying to come up to Baker around mid-April or so. All right, so Males arrive first and they establish a territory. I gotta bust out my phone because the audio on this doesn't work too well. But um, they'll sing the A song typically. And usually what we say is, you know, the A song is the song that they use to um, attract a mate. And the B song is something more where they're using that in defense of their territory. So we've got, usually early in the season, you hear a lot of A song, and then they'll switch to B later in the season. The territories are established and they have mates, um, but that's not always true. You know, you'll have mated pairs singing A song or vice versa. But a lot of times when you go into the forest, if you hear, especially later in the season, if you hear a golden cheek just singing A song over and over and over again, that's probably, fairly good indication that um, that bird doesn't have uh, a mate and still trying to attract one. Because they don't always always get a mate, some, some don't. 
most do, but some don't. And then the B song, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, more for defending the territory. But you can tell them apart. I'm going to play the A song for you here, if it works. This is also called the La Cucaracha song. See if you can hear that and uh, hear this. Hope you all can hear that. Like La Cucaracha. Okay, compare that to the, the B song. song sounds a lot angrier than the A song. But you can tell them apart, so that's kind of cool if you go into the forest um, looking for golden cheeks and you hear a B song, you can make some assumptions about uh, the fact that it may have a mate, that it's defending its territory. And if you're hearing a lot of A song, you can make an assumption that maybe it doesn't have a mate, it's more about attracting the female at this point. Uh, Anyway, the females are going to arrive a week or two later and they're going to find a mate. Not really sure what they're looking at when they uh, decide to select a mate. There's some theories out there, but um, as far as we know, they don't mate with the same male every year. It seems to be a different female. Um, so they do split up, they go south and they come back. They're not, they're not staying together like some birds will do. Okay, at Baker, we think we have about 60 pairs of golden cheek warblers, so that would be 120 total. They all had uh, mates. Um, that number is in flux still. Uh, I'm doing some point counts and some other surveys to try to, to get a better number for that, but right now it's, you know, 60 seems a pretty good guess. And um, one of the ways that we can tell these golden cheeks how many we have, because if you know if you go out in the forest and you know, think about if you're a biologist and you're out there and you're trying to count these birds, they're notoriously hard to count because they number one all look the same to us anyway. And number two, when they sing, their song tends to carry quite a distance. So trying to get a firm number can be a little tricky. But one thing that helps us is that we'll put we'll catch some on a study plot, use that as like a sample. And they'll put these things called color bands on their legs. So this bird is, is fine. We usually get some, some questions about, is that bird dead? I'm like, no, we don't. We don't rip their heads off before we band them. That would be poor science. But um, this bird's fine. It's on its back. The head is between the fingers. And when it's like that, it's typically pretty calm. And it can't flap around, can't hurt itself. So We'll catch them, we'll put these color bands on their legs. So this one's got two orange bands on his left and a dark green and a silver band on his right. Yeah, I think so. So that'd be orange, orange, dark green, silver. If you saw him in the field, if you read from left to right, top to bottom. The silver band here uh, has, is issued by Fish and Wildlife Service and it has a serial number on it um, that's unique to that bird. So if you were to find, uh, say, a dead bird, um, you could take that band, give it to the Fish and Wildlife, and they'll send you back a little certificate, which I'll show you in a few minutes. But also the color combination, too, is unique to that bird. So if this bird were to, you know, if I banded him at Baker, and then he were to fly to Colleen or someplace like that, um, somebody could read his bands properly in the proper order orange, orange, dark green, silver, uh, we wouldn't know exactly which bird that is, um, which makes it pretty helpful when you're doing stuff with dispersal and things like that. But anyway, so the silver band, oops, let's go back. Anyway, so we catch these guys uh, with things called mist nets. There's Cindy Sperry. Anybody knows Cindy Sperry back when she was helping out? She's in Mexico now. But anyway, so we had mist net these guys. And the trick is to get them down the, into the net. So, you know, these birds like, like to hang out in the canopy. 
So the question is, you know, how do you get them to fly down into this little net that you've got set up in the understory? The answer to that is that you play their, their song. So you find out um, which bird you want to catch. You go roughly to the middle of the territory that you want to catch that bird in and set up the net, play the song. I've got this little model, I call it the GIMP. Looks kind of like a golden cheek warbler that got stepped on by an elephant, but apparently it's good enough. I stick that on a tree under, underneath the phone um, and you play. Usually I start with the A song because it's more mellow. <laughs> then, then if that's not working, maybe go up to a B song because they get a little more uh, aggressive with the B song. And I would say, gosh, at least six times out of 10, you'll catch the bird. Maybe seven times out of 10, you'll catch the bird. Sometimes there's some birds that are just too smart. They won't go for it, they never come down. But um, if you can catch enough of the birds in an area, that's, that's good enough. I remember back when I started doing this, gosh, in the 90s, we were using uh, tape players, cassette recorders. You tell the kids in the schools about cassette recorders nowadays, they have no idea what you're talking about. Anyway, so here's uh, Miss Net. You can see one pole is here, another pole is there. You got this fine mesh between it with little pockets and it's really hard to see i've i've caught people in these things i've caught um sometimes you get a hawk this never happened at baker but in prior jobs i've gotten a hawk we got a vulture once which was really kind of awkward getting a vulture out of that thing um but it's a pretty good system if done properly don't try this at home <laughs> you need a lot of training to to catch and handle birds so here's a uh, Golden cheek in the net it gets kind of tangled, so they'll hit that net and they kind of fall into the pocket. And golden cheeks are pretty mellow. Most warblers are. They'll just kind of lay in the pocket, usually maybe with their little talons. But other birds like wrens or uh, cardinals can really get tangled in this stuff when they hit the net. Taking out the cardinals is a nightmare. So you have the bird, and you have a special pair of pliers where you apply that um, metal band from Fish and Wild that I was talking about. That's what you see here. So these pliers are applying the metal band. Um, so here's a banded one. Now, if you saw this one in, this would be kind of like a test. If you saw this one in the wild in your binoculars and you wanted to get the color combination, what you do is you got to think about the bird's right and the bird's left, not your right and left. So that's number one. And then you read it from top to bottom, left to right. So this guy would be uh, black, that's the left, dark blue, then purple would be called mauve, then the silver band, which is that metal band. So this would be uh, black, dark blue, mauve, silver. So yeah, if you're ever out and you do see some abandoned bird, it is good information to give to the manager of whoever, you know, whichever preserve you're at. You know, if it's Baker, you could tell me. If you're at the refuge, you could tell, I think Scott Rowan is out there. Um, whoever, they, they'd love to get this information from you. So that's something that's, um, that's good to pass on if you can see it. And photos are even better if you get a photo. So these are what the bird bands look like. These are not for um, golden cheek warblers. There's these are other species, but you can see the serial number that's on there that's unique to the bird. So if they do lose all their color bands and you need to find out who the bird is, you can catch the bird again, read the serial number off the, the aluminum band, and then uh, you'll know exactly who it is. And so like I mentioned before, sometimes you do find dead birds and sometimes they're banded this is from Michigan. I was at the beach and I found this dead uh, herring gull that was banded. And so I uh, sent the band into Fish and Wildlife. We sent it to uh, the bird banding lab and they could look it up. And this is the, the final data point for this bird that it could offer for its life. So, so it's good to know. I mean, they got some information from this bird, the fact that it was banded. Plus they send you this little uh, certificate that you Add to your files. Okay, moving on here. Good for time. I speed up. All right, so uh, Golden Cheek Warbler surveys. This is a 100 acre survey that we used to do at Baker, but I just wanted to point out um, these are some of the maps that we generate. 
from these colored banded birds. And um, golden cheeks are very, uh, the site fidelity is very high for them. So what that means is they'll, they'll fly down south, um, go to say Honduras, they come back here and they come back to essentially the same spot. So if you look at these three birds, you've got dark blue, black mauve silver, which is, dark blue, black. he's up here in the north. You got red, silver, dark blue, yellow, which is, he's always hard, right? In the south, then we got that banded silver, pink mauve, which is in the east. So just kind of keep those in mind. So this is 2011, 2012, dark blue, black mauve, silver. Once again, he's in the north the same plot red silver dark blue yellow once again is in the south of the same plot and not banded silver pink mob is once again in the east this is after going down south and flying back 2013 same thing dark blue black mob silver is up in the north again but now uh not banded silver pink mob did not come back um something happened either in the wintering grounds or during the flyway now he's gone, so old red, silver, dark blue, yellow saw his chance, and he leaped over to the east and kind of took his territory, but still in the same area that they were before. So you know, a lot of times with these color banded birds, if you don't see them come back the next season, there's really only two options. Either they're, they died, which is probably the most likely option, or that um, maybe they disperse somewhere, which sometimes they do, and they go somewhere else. But that's kind of not as frequent. 2013, uh, out of the 101 returning band and golden cheek warblers, 95% returned or stayed within the same study plot. So this is what we call high site fidelity. So these golden cheeks, they need mature ash juniper, which people call cedar, to build their nests. If you look at the nest here, it's made out of strips of cedar. That's what they instinctively do. If they didn't have uh, the juniper around, they could not do that. And they use hardwoods and the juniper to forage for insects because these guys are insectivores. They love to eat insects, arthropods. So ash juniper, uh, which people know is cedar. I just want to put a plug in for it. It is a native tree. Um, and it's very water efficient, actually. It has waxy um, leaves here so that slows down transpiration they're not losing water through the leaves they have these branches if you look at it now picture this thing as a funnel where this is the opening of the funnel and this is where the water is headed so when the when it rains you know the water hits these uh, branches it gets funneled to the stem of the tree and it goes to the ground where the roots are and it's you know super water efficient so sometimes i hear that they waste water etc that they're not native both those things are not true Okay, so what do golden cheeks eat? This is from an older study, 1975. Um, Lepidopter and larvae. So yeah, they love caterpillars. And if you're out in the field and watching a caterpillar get beat up by golden cheek warblers, pretty brutal. They'll take in their bill and they'll slam it against the branch until it's just this mushy mass. But they love to eat those guys. So during this study, most of it was uh, Lepidopterin, but they also eat grasshoppers. Neuropterans, um, flies, and mollusks. Probably not octopi, but snails. Um, they also eat spiders too if they get desperate. Here's a Lepidopteran uh, getting fed to some nestlings. So they usually only nest once per season. Sometimes they'll do two broods if, if it's a wet, good year. Three to five eggs, usually four. Female incubates for about 12 days. After about nine days in the nest, the young golden cheek warblers fledge. This is a young one here. You can tell by the fact that it's got what I call nest head, where the kind of like bed head when you get up in the morning, but this is the feathers. Doesn't have a much of a tail, mostly brown. Uh, the parents will split up the brood and continue to feed them over the next several weeks. So once these birds leave the nest, the parents are still taking care of them. Uh, kind of like middle schoolers, teenagers. But um, you can see this one begging and the parents are like, I don't want to feed you again. But he's going to because this one's going to be so annoying until he finally gets fed. Here's a video from 
a neighbor, Julia Land, took this at her property, but it shows uh, this little fledgling here getting fed. And you hear that little chipping noise. That's a good way to find them. There it goes. I don't want to give it to you. I take it. And I'll give it back. I spent too much time in the woods. Um, and there it is. Ignore you. Yep, fly away. Good. Fledgling has been fed. If you hear that really rapid uh, chipping noise, that's a good way to find these fledglings this time of year. So usually they uh, successfully uh, fledge a couple nestlings per nest. A lot of the nests don't make it um, to fruition. Lots of predators out there. So this is from a study for three years in an urban setting. I think it was actually done in the BCP. Could be wrong about that. But anyway, they looked at um, what was hitting these nests. So they put these uh, cameras on nests and they just looked at all the data. So we'll go through this real quickly. But another reason to hate fire ants, yeah, they will go up into a nest and uh, kill uh, nestlings. They'll sting them until they're dead and come back and dismember them, which is kind of brutal. Cooper's hawks, good old Cooper hawks. And they like to eat pretty much anything they can catch, especially birds. <laughs> fox squirrels, which is probably the most disturbing one. Just picturing a fox squirrel chowing away on a nestling. Um, but yeah, that does happen. Woodhouse of scrub jays, they're pretty smart predators. They'll find a nest, they'll chow it down, but the most predation came from uh, rat snakes. So rat snakes, if you've ever seen one climb a tree, it's pretty impressive, but they are pretty good at finding uh, bird nests. All right, so another problem that golden cheeks are facing is avian pox. And I haven't seen this at Baker yet, but I have seen it from other birds on the BCP, but they get this, um, this virus that's transmitted by mosquitoes, they can get these lesions on their uh, feet and their legs and their bill. And you know, a lot of times they survive it, but sometimes they don't. It interferes with their perching or, or feeding too much. Okay, not much is known regarding their wintering ecology. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. It's a sad photo, the wintering ecology of the Golden Warbler. But they winter in the highlands of southern Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Usually up around 2,700 to 6,600 feet above sea level. So they're up in the mountains a little bit. That's where their habitat is down south. Um, during the winter, they're in these mixed uh, foraging species flocks. Usually only about one golden cheek warbler per flock, maybe sometimes two, but they they seem to be keeping other golden cheek warblers out of the foraging flock, so, um, which is kind of bad in a way, just because there is um, limited habitat down there and only so many flocks can fit, et cetera. When that habitat starts to decrease, then there's gonna be some problems with um, maybe accommodating this many golden cheeks as we would like. Rapid poll 1990 analyzed species composition of a bunch of these flocks down south, and it was kind of interesting to see who these golden cheek warblers were hanging out with down there. So here's the top five. That's for you. Townsend's warblers, 69% of the time. So these are in the mixed species foraging flock. We have blue headed vireos. We got the hermit warbler, hangs out a lot with the golden cheek warbler. Next one, this next one's not a surprise. You'd, Kind of assume that the black throated green would be in there, but it's not number one. Number one was the Wilson warbler. It's probably cuter anyway. There is a study going on right now called the Geolocator Study that um, it's being run out of Fort Hood. Uh, John Macy is heading that up, but they're they're catching golden cheek warblers, and I've helped with this a little bit, and they put this little. Uh, data logger on them. So it kind of looks like bird underwear when you're putting it on, but you put it over their legs and it kind of sits on their lower back and it has this light stop. Then you let the bird go and light will come through that transparent stalk. It goes into the data logger. And from looking at where solar noon is compared to the internal clock on this data logger, they can figure out latitude and longitude roughly of where this bird is. Problem is you have to catch the bird to put the logger on, but then you also have to catch the bird again when it comes back, take the logger off, download it, 
let the bird go. But they are getting some interesting um, information about the, the wintering grounds that we didn't realize as far as where they're hanging out and that sort of thing. So it's still preliminary. It still has a lot of um, analysis to do on this. And I think the COVID-19 probably put a damper on it as well, like everything else. But but next two to five years, I think there should be some cool stuff coming out. Okay, so somewhere between 9,600, 36,000 gold sheep remaining. Their list is endangered 1990. So the big question is, you know, why are they endangered? And this, you know, this is true for most endangered species. You know, typically they're endangered because they're losing their habitat or it's getting degraded in some fashion. So here's uh, 1995, just kind of illustrate that. Keep your eyes on this portion here. This isn't that long ago, you know, 1995. And then here we go, 2002. You can see a lot of uh, growth happened in that short seven year span. Continues further and further. And then this is kind of where it's at now, where it's built out. So you can see, you know, obviously when you cut down a forest and put a house in there, you're losing habitat. But also, you know, 2011, we had the drought. And so talk about degradation of habitat, you know, keep an eye out in this part of the sanctuary and also this area. But you can see the die off that we had, mostly juniper um, from the drought. The good news is, uh, you know, this, these areas are starting to be revegetated by more juniper. And actually, I, during point counts this year, was the first year that I've seen golden cheeks actually in there, in this dead area, which was kind of no man's land, just a bunch of wrens and maybe some painted buntings. But Gold cheeks are starting to kind of explore it a little bit now, which is good. Anyway, so without juniper, they can't build their nest. Without the hardwoods as well, they cannot forage. So, you know, they need them both. Roughly, you say 70% um, juniper to 30% hardwood is, is ideal. Also, in areas where um, land prices aren't as high as they are here, Sometimes habitat is converted to rangeland, which is kind of a double whammy because number one, you lose the habitat that was there, but also you start getting cowbirds that can start hitting patches of habitat that may still be adjacent to these uh, grazed lands. And so cowbirds, you know, they're, they're a native bird. I think they're pretty cool. They figured out um, how to um, not raise their own young. So what they do is they lay an egg in a host nest and then that host, if they don't recognize that egg as a cowbird egg, they raise it as their own. So here's an example of that. This is a yellow warbler, and it's feeding this gargantuan um, cowbird chick. It thinks it's this ugly little baby, but it, <laughs> it's not. So anyway, uh, when they do that, a lot of times the female when, cowbird, when she lays that egg in the host nest, she'll also peck a hole in the eggs that are there or if she doesn't do that, typically these cowbird chicks will hatch a little bit earlier than the, um, than the birds that are in there that are supposed to be in there and they'll get more food and grow faster and bigger and sometimes push out the, uh, the host uh, young. So they decrease the uh, productivity of um, gold cheek warblers and black cap burials probably even more so because black caps are more so in that sort of habitat, rangeland habitat. Anyway, so another thing, this is something that I find to be interesting because sometimes, you know, we've done this in other situations with other species, but we think we're doing something good. And uh, actually we're kind of messing things up, but uh, let's look at deer. So deer population, it's been going up. Lots of reasons for that kind of predators. There's more graze lands and urban yards that they can forage in. There's a hunting season that's managed and forced pretty thoroughly nowadays. But the biggest reason is the fact that we got rid of this cute little guy, um, screw worm, which is a maggot of a fly. They call it screw worm because it kind of looks like a screw if you look at it here. But you know, the females essentially, here's the life cycle of it, but the females will come, they'll lay just tons of eggs and an open wound. Um, then the larvae are going to hatch and they kind of 
burrow into the wound and feed off it for a while. Then they'll drop to the ground and pupate and kind of fly. And so, you know, multiple infestations can kill a host uh, in five to 10 days. And <clears throat> what this, um, what really got attention for this species is that, you know, besides being a little disgusting, is that they were hitting um, uh, things like goats and cows and livestock essentially. So the ranchers are like, hey man, we gotta get rid of this fly. And so they, oops, that's their shingle-like manner there. And that's what they look like an artist's rendition of uh, a screw worm in a wound. Anyway, so the scientists looked at it and they found out that the female fly mates only once. And so they started this program called the sterile male program and they had this hangar in Florida where they did this. And this has got to be the most disgusting biological job you can have, but um, they raised maggots in there and then they would, you can imagine what that smelled like, but they were raising maggots and then they uh, would hit them with a low dose of radiation, make the uh, flies sterile, take these um, sterile flies, release them back in the wild where they would mate with the wild flies who didn't know they were sterile and they would never have any uh, fertile offspring. And they did this for decades. Well, by 1983, the screw room was gone from Texas. It's still down in Mexico, but we don't have it here anymore. The problem is though, these um, flies were acting as a check on the deer population too. So now without these flies, we have more deer. And what they do is they love to browse out these hardwoods that we need. So we're having some problems with hardwoods reaching maturity, which is a problem because that's, you know, you need that 30% in uh, gold chick warbler habitat of hardwoods or they're not gonna do as well as they could. So Dr. Russell and her grad student uh, Fowler, or Dr. Fowler and her grad student um, did some, some studies on this. And I think this is on the BCP as well, but what they found is that, you know, Spanish oaks, uh, very few are growing since 1935, getting to an adult um, height. Plateau live oaks, black cherries, and ash don't seem to be recruiting adults. And they came to the conclusion that intense browsing seems to be the cause because these things grow fairly slowly, about five centimeters a year. So you can imagine how long it takes for a, you know, a seedling hardwood to become an adult hardwood. Lots of opportunity in that time for a, a a deer to either browse it out or when it gets bigger, they can sometimes girdle them when they grow up their uh, antlers uh, on those stems. And also low understory light levels due to a dense growth of ash juniper, they thought could also be a contributing factor to the fact. So it could be a couple of different things going on here. All right, so wintering grounds. Prior to the 90s, um, golden cheek warblers were known only from 40 specimens collected outside of their breeding range because they're hard to find down there. Then I uh, started working with the Alliance for the Conservation of Mesoamerican Pine Oak Forest. It's kind of like the Mexican TNC. And they've partnered up with the BCP on certain levels as well as Parks and Wildlife and the TNC here. But what's interesting is that in Honduras, I and mean, these guys were actively looking for golden cheek warblers um, down south. The ornithologists were going out, going to the places where they thought they would be. And, you know, 2006 and 2007, they only had 19 sightings. Next year, they had 41 um, all year. You, know, you can get 41 sightings of Golden Cheeks and Baker in probably about a week if you wanted to. So they're hard to find. Um, what's also interesting about this is that you know, we've banded thousands of birds here in the BCP and, and elsewhere, Golden Cheek Warblers. And as far as I know to date, they've only found maybe one banded bird down south, so, so we're missing something. So they tried to estimate potential breeding habitat down south. They think there's, or this is actually in the breeding ground. So here they're saying, okay, there's probably enough breeding habitat in Texas for um, 230,000 Golden Creek Warblers, which is interesting because um, Jim Mueller from the National Wildlife Refuge just got some 
preliminary data back from a point count survey he did on the breeding range uh, just the last couple of years. And he's, he's estimating about 100,000 males, so probably about 200,000 birds is what he's guessing across the breeding range. Um, it's probably a fairly good guess. So whoever did this uh, guesstimate earlier was not too far off the mark. But then you look at the wintering habitat, you know, they looked at how much there is there to support birds, and they came up with was probably only enough habitat for 35,000 to 56,000 gold cheek warblers. And you know, there's a dichotomy there between how much is we think is available down south to how much we think is available up here. Um, what I think the problem is, is that we're not calculating the wintering habitat right. I think there's probably something that we're missing there. And I think that's going to be illuminated when this geolocator uh, project gets you know, the data finally comes out on that. But we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. The bad news is, is that the wintering habitat is not really protected. So, you know, the current forest cover that we're aware of is 20%. 26% of the original cover. Um, the current rate of deforestation, the forest down south may be gone in as early as 45 years. And only 10% of the region is under former protection. So there's some, there's some issues regarding um, safeguarding the, uh, the wintering grounds. We're doing, you know, up here in the breeding grounds, we're doing, we're doing all right, we could always do better, but it's definitely a lot better than what's happening down south. Finally, so another question too, if you're thinking about conserving this bird, um, you got the breeding grounds up here in Texas, wintering grounds through here, which isn't really being protected. But if you recall what I mentioned earlier, they do fly from, from the south to the north and vice versa through Mexico, through the mountains. So that you have to conserve the flyway as well. And we really have no idea at all to, to date what points that they're using in Mexico, where the important stopover areas are in Mexico. So you really to preserve this species, you gotta have all three protected. And right now I would say we've got, I don't know, maybe one part of that at <laughs> best. So, uh, so there's still uh, some work to be done. And finally, Here's some photos of back in the days when we could be in larger groups. Uh, we can't actually do it. We can, we can look at people doing it just for old time's sake. Here's some scouts building a cowbird trap. I tried to lock them in there, but they got out. Here's a little fledgling back when we had open house. Those are the days. What else we got here? Making some signs, yeah, some art. I, that's all I've got. I think I've got 10 minutes or whatever for questions if anybody has any. Should Thank you off? so much, Chris. Um, we do have several questions from the audience. Um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between the Balcones Canyon Lands Preserve and the Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge? Sure, so the, the Balcone, Balcones Canyonlands Preserve is, the permit for that is held by um, the city of Austin and Travis County. And so that's, that's in Western Travis County. I like that map, if I could find it. It's kind of as I talk, I'll just go back, but it's mostly Western Travis County. And um, you have a lot of different players that are a part of it. So, you know, if you look at this map, this is all BCP in this little chunk up here. It's kind of, you know, we, they're trying to make it so that it's a conti contiguous piece of preserve. It's better for the wildlife to do it that way. Um, and as you can see from here, there's, you know, Audubon's part of that, LCRA's part of that, um, the county, the city, TNC. Most of this land isn't open to the public. You know, some of it is, 
and you've probably been on BCP land and you haven't realized it, like Emma Long Metropolitan Park is BCP, the Greenbelt is BCP, Mount Bunnell is technically BCP. And so lots of different parcels trying to make up this larger preserve. The, the refuge is way up in Lago Vista. It's right here on the map. This is all federally owned. So this is um, fish and wildlife. So, but they were made around the same time. And the idea was, you know, when they were talking about, you know, how can we protect this, this bird, these Carson vertebrates, um, and the black-eyed vertebrate. You know, scientists recommended that they needed, gosh, I can't remember, 120,000 acres, something like that. But, you know, this one's got 30, eventually Balcones National Wildlife Refuge, I think is gonna have around 35 or 40,000 acres. So two different entities kind of doing the same thing, but you look at who holds the permit, the Fish and Wildlife, and for us, it's uh, for the Balcones Canlands Preserve, it's um, Travis County and City of Austin, and for the, the refuge, um, that's, um, they're, they're federal. I don't know if that makes any sense. That does. <laughs> um, our next question is, do we know how much of the original breeding grounds in Texas have been lost to development? You know, I think people have looked at that. I, I can't really say a number off the top of my head. There's a lot of debate on um, what constitutes breeding grounds and how to quantify that, because it's not all the same. There's, there's different quality of, of habitat too, like I mentioned before. Baker Sanctuary, for instance, is what you would consider not poor habitat, but not the best. It's kind of solid, so solidly in the middle, so it's, it's decent habitat. But um, even the BCP, you know, you, there's chunks of land that you'll designate as habitat, but um, the birds there are, are fairly dispersed. They're not that dense. So. Now, we've lost a ton of habitat, but the question is, is I don't think we can really get a handle on the quality of the habitat that we lost. So it's, it's really hard to say, actually. Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd love to give you a number, but I really can't. No worries. Um, our next question is, you mentioned playing back the Golden Cheeked Warbler songs for the purpose of capturing and banding them. Is playing back their song for leisure birding okay to help spot them? No, you should never do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, whenever you play a, a song, this goes for birds that are golden sheep warblers either, you know, especially during their, their breeding time. If you play a song to attract them in, um, that means they're not doing what they should be doing, which is finding food and protecting their territories. And it kind of stresses them out a little bit, you know, because that gets their adrenaline going. So. And that goes for owl calls too. I wouldn't play owl calls to attract birds either. I would either you see it or you don't. Um, and if you try hard enough, you'll see it. But I definitely don't recommend um, using playbacks. The only reason we use playbacks is so that we get them to come to that net. Otherwise, there'd be no way to, uh, to capture them. Yeah, but don't do it while you're birding. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what type of ethical preservation issues do you face with trying to help the golden cheeked warbler? And are there specific types of groups that are affected by the Endangered Species Act? Maybe farmers and ranchers? What was the first part of that question? What type of ethical preservation issues do you face with trying to help the golden cheeked warbler? Ethical preservation issues. I would have to get a little more information on that one. I'm not sure what they what they mean. So what was the second part of the question? Are there specific uh, types of groups that are affected by the Endangered Species Act? Maybe farmers and ranchers that come to mind? Oh, I imagine there are. I mean, I think you know, most people in general like the Endangered Species Act, but if you've got an endangered species on your property and you wanted to do something with that property other than preserve their habitat, I think you'd probably have a problem with it. Um, and I can understand that, but um, 
I don't know. I don't want to get too much into <laughs> ethics or morality or that kind of. That's, that's not really the point of this this presentation. But um, if you're asking my opinion, I think it's probably more important to if you're going to err on the side of uh, somebody's property rights versus saving the species that could otherwise go extinct, I would err on the side of saving the species. Thank you. Um, which county has the highest density of golden cheeked warblers? You know, I, I don't know. I, Travis County has to be up there. Um, the thing is, like I mentioned before, they're hard to count. And even getting a, a density, gosh, you could, you know, get five scientists in a room and start talking about densities of golden cheek warblers and come away with 12 different answers. But it's, it's, uh, it depends on the models that you use and your, your protocol. Um, so, but I, from the stuff that I've read, you know, Travis County is definitely in the top three uh, in the vicinity. You know, the counties that are adjacent to us are pretty, pretty good too. It's just, um, like I mentioned, it's just really hard to, to tell. So that's been a, a bit of a curse with Golden Cheek Warbler research is you know, how to how to accurately count these birds. So we're still working on that. Absolutely. Um, and our last question that we have time for, what is your spark bird? Uh, mine, I guess, was a bird called the spotted dove. And it's not really, I saw it when I was in Hawaii and when I was working there. That was for whatever reason. It's not really a, a a rare bird or anything like that. It was pretty common, but it was just kind of an interesting bird, and it kind of got me looking a little bit closer at things. Great. Well, thank you so much. Those are all the questions we have time for. Chris, thank you so much um, for your presentation today, and um, thank you everyone for coming. Hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you.